Hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Spencer Rukti. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm the author events manager here at Third Place Books in Seattle, Washington. Um, I am calling today from the Gert Gutenberg room at our Lake Forest Park location, which you can tell because there's a portrait of Gutenberg printing the Bible right behind me. Um, uh, I'm really pleased to welcome Andrea Chapella, the author of The Visible Unseen, uh, Kelsey Venata, the book's translator, and Fabiola Mancelli, who created the beautiful artwork for this book. Um, welcome. First of all, I want to invite you all to use the chat window at the bottom of your screen to say hello and let us know where you're calling in from. Um, and while you're doing that, I will mention that Third Place Books has a calendar full of events leading into the holiday season, both in person and virtual. Um, if your interest is translated literature, like it is mine, we have wonderful offerings for you. Uh, on November 3rd, we are partnering with Community Bookstore in Brooklyn to present a panel on the late Brazilian writer Xiao Gilberto No um, in his newly translated novel, Hugs and Cuddles, a very queer, transgressive book that I promise is unlike anything you've ever read. Uh, that panel will include the book's translator, Edgar, uh, Edgar Garbolato, uh, Matilda Bernstein Sycamore, and Andrea Lawler. Then on November 15th, we have a virtual event with classicist Stephanie McCarter uh, for her new translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis. Um, Carter is the first female translator of the epic into English in over 60 years. And in this new edition, she addresses accuracy in translation and its representation of women, gender dynamics of power, and sexual violence in Ovid's classic. Uh, Third Place Books hosts over 200 author events a year. I really encourage you to visit thirdplacebooks.com slash events for our full calendar, uh, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter. As mentioned, that chat window is open at the bottom of your screen, and we encourage you to use it respectfully tonight. Uh, during the last 15 minutes or so of this event, we will also have time for your questions. So please, uh, if you have questions for our authors this evening, submit those to the Q&A window below which is separate from the chat window at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we also offer closed captioning for anyone who is interested. Just click the live transcript button at the bottom of your window to turn that feature on or off. Uh, a reminder that this event will be recorded. So if you have to miss anything, we'll be emailing a recording to everyone who registered. And of course, you can order the visible unseen from our website or stop by any one of our three locations in the Seattle area. Every purchase you make supports the future of this author series, so thank you. And now, without further ado, I am pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Andrea Chapella has a degree in chemistry from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and an MFA in Spanish creative writing from the University of Iowa. She is the recipient of multiple awards, including the 2019 Jose Luis Martinez National Prize uh, for Grados de Miopia, and she was named one of Granta's best young Spanish language novelists in 2021. Her translator, Kelsey Venata, is the author of the poetry book Rare Earth, and her book length translation, Damascus Atlantis, uh, by Marie Silk, uh, Silkeberg, was long listed for the 2022 Penn Award for Poetry in Translation. Kelsey holds MFAs in poetry and literary translation from the University of Iowa and worked as the program manager of the American Literary Translators Association. Joining Andrea, or Andrea and Kelsey in conversation is the artist Fabiola Mancelli. Uh, Fabiola has a degree in computer mediated arts from Victoria University and an MFA in photography and vi uh, visual arts from Massachusetts College of Art and Design. She has received multiple awards, including the Fulbright Garcia Robles Fellowship, and is currently part of the National System of Art Creators Grant from Funka. The topic of today's conversation is The Visible Unseen, published by Restless Books. Uh, if you, like myself, are interested in the intersection of literature and science, and I guarantee you will find this book fascinating. Andrea Chapella is a chemist by training, as I mentioned, and divides this book into sections about glass, mirrors, and the physics of light. Uh, the lyric essay is a really difficult genre to pull off uh, because of its, all of its untethered wanderings, and I think Andrea and Kelsey nail it in this translated collection. So please join me in welcoming Andrea, Kelsey, and Fabiola to your screen. Thank you so much, Spencer and Third Place Books, for having us. Um, Thank you everyone who is here tonight with us. Um, I also want to thank everyone at Restless Books who helped create this book. <laughs> Alison is here again, like always. Um, thank you for all the work you've put into the book. 
And tonight's conversation, we thought, uh, is the only <laughs> event where the three of us will talk. Uh, this book is the second book the three of us collaborated with. In, and we'll talk about the first one in a, probably during this conversation. But we thought we would start by reading a bit, um, a bilingual reading of the book. And I'll read the Spanish and Kelsey will read the English. And we'll read from the first essay, a couple of fragments that are about glass and the strange, strange behavior that glass has in this world. And after that, we'll start the conversation. El acto de ver a través. 1. Crecí en una casa de madera y vidrio. No hay nada que ver afuera. La casa debe mirar hacia adentro, dijo el arquitecto, y en el centro construyó un jardín. 2. The act of seeing through. Object of study. Glass. 1. I grew up in a house made of wood and glass. Nothing to see outside. The house should look inward, said the architect, and in the center, he built a garden. 12. En el lenguaje del día a día, las palabras vidrio y cristal son intercambiables. A lo mucho, un cristal es más caro y delicado. Por ejemplo, las copas de mi abuela son de cristal, no de vidrio. En química, sin embargo, son objetos totalmente diferentes. Los cristales son sólidos cuyos átomos y moléculas tienen un orden regular que se repite en el espacio. La sal de mesa es un cristal. Moléculas de sodio y potasio acomodadas en cubitos regulares. Los, vidrio, los vidrios carecen de esta estructura. Son caóticos y ni siquiera sabemos si son sólidos. 12. In everyday speech, the words glass and crystal are interchangeable. At most, crystal is more expensive and more delicate. For example, my grandmother's wine glasses are made of crystal, not glass. Chemically, however, they're completely different objects. Crystals are solids whose atoms and molecules have a regular order that repeats in space. Table, table salt is a crystal. Sodium and potassium molecules arranged in even cubes. Glasses lack this structure. They're chaotic, and we don't even know if they're solids. 22. Cita. El problema más profundo e interesante de la teoría del estado sólido es probablemente la naturaleza del vidrio y la transición vitrea. 22. Quote. The deepest and most interesting unsolved problem in solid state theory is probably the theory of the nature of glass and the glass transition. 33. Imagina ser un material fundido. Hervir a más de 1800 grados centígrados hasta encandecer. Imagina comenzar a enfriarte lento, tan lento que cada uno de tus átomos se apiña. Te vuelves pesada. En el diagrama de fases te estás acercando al estado sólido, donde cristalizarás. O no, tal vez tu naturaleza es vitria y puedes sentir que tus moléculas siguen en movimiento después del punto de fusión. Caes por la pendiente. Imagina el desorden en tu interior, que aumenta con la viscosidad que aumenta al bajar la temperatura a 20 grados centígrados. Eres casi un sólido, pero solo apenas. 33. Imagine you're a melted material, boiled at over 1800 degrees Celsius, 3272 degrees Fahrenheit, until white hot. You begin to cool slowly, so slowly that your atoms huddle together, huddle closer together. You get heavy. On the phase diagram, you're moving toward a solid state where you'll crystallize. Or not. Maybe you have a glass-like nature and you can feel your molecules keep moving beyond the melting point as you drop along the slope. Imagine the disorder inside you growing along with your viscosity, growing as the temperature lowers to 20 degrees Celsius. You're almost a solid, but only barely. Thank you, Kelsey. So as you can see, the book moves between the personal, uh, my life as a child, um, being raised in a house um, where my mother is a mathematician and my dad is a physicist, 
to a house where every explanation of the world went back to science. And it also moves uh, around me as an adult looking at three objects, um, as Spencer said, glass, mirrors, and light, and trying to see it through the lens of science, and then trying to see the language of science through the lens of poetry. And the book came to be when I was in Iowa. I had finished my master's thesis, which was a book of poems where I mixed um, science language with heartbreak and I try to go back to science to understand my heartbreak at the moment. And I wasn't at all very pleased with the verse form, but I was very intrigued by the lyrical essay. It's a form I encounter in Iowa too. I started reading Maggie Nelson and Kate Sambreno and so many wonderful people who use the form there. And I wanted to try it because I felt that it could give me everything I loved about poetry, but I would be close enough to prose to be able to pull it off. Um, but then how the, the idea of the book came to be in a class that I was sharing with Kelsey. We were in a Latin American poetry class and I don't know why, I don't remember, but I read out loud from a, from a Google, from the Google, this idea of glass not being, that we didn't know what glass was, that we didn't know if it was solid or liquid. And I read it to illustrate something I have forgotten, <laughs> but I do remember when a guy who was a poet and was sitting in the room with us said, that's beautiful. And I thought to myself, yes, I agree, but I don't understand why you're saying it. <laughs> Because I could tell that the reason we found that information beautiful was very, very different. And I think it for me it was beautiful because it's fascinated. It's fascinating to me that there are things as simple as a question of is glass a solid or a liquid that seems so simple and so natural to say it's solid. And then when you look at it through the lens of science, we realize it's one of the hardest questions to answer and that we might never know. And I I find those places of not knowing uh, fascinating, but I couldn't tell why he found it beautiful. And this whole book started there. In a way, I wanted to put myself in the position of having to stop thinking as someone who was trained to see the world through a scientific lens and start owning the fact that I wanted to be a writer. And so I needed to have more of a writer's lens and so the whole book is about the act of seeing. It's about uh, me getting to know my own point of view. It's about me seeing through glass and trying to solve if it's a solid or a liquid, me seeing myself in very many different mirrors and finding them all very complicated to understand. Mm -hmm. And then me trying to tell you the story of light, the scientific story of light, which is I found one of the most fascinating questions, open questions we have of what light is. And I wrote the book. I wrote the book between the United States and Mexico and Madrid. Um, and I convinced Kelsey somehow <laughs> that it was worth translating. And it then hard. <laughs> in a weird turn of events, I met Fabiola through that book in Spanish when it came out. Uh, this is the form, it's a little chew up by the cat. This is the form I had in Mexico and this book made its way to Fabiola a couple of months after it got published. Um, and then we started working together in a collaboration that at the end um, birthed somehow the book, The Visible Unseen. So I want to talk about, yes, about the book, but also, yes, Fabiola has to read a little kitten. kitten. Um, but also about how they came to know the book, why they wanted to work with me on it. And so first, I think I'll go with Fabiola. Fabiola, when did you encounter Egrados de Miopia, The Visible Unseen, and why were you interested in it? Well, it was, I guess that the, just before the pandemic hit and the world closed, I got uh -huh. an invitation by a SPAC that is a, um, art collection in Mexico City that has a space and they they have a publications um, program where they invite an artist and a writer to make a book project. So to try to 
think about the book as an exhibition space or like a collaboration, something that is beyond just writing whatever Andrea was writing about or making my usual work, but making something together into a book. So I got the invite, I think early March and they suggested Grados de Miopia for me to read. Um, and I was blown away. I loved it. it. Like, I think I read it in one afternoon uh, and I underlined all of it. <laughs> um, thinking about like, like I've been thinking about light and glass and como translations of states of uh, physics and chemistry through photography. But it was such a pleasure to read Andrea's words that it really hooked me. So from there, we decided to invite Andrea to be my partner in crime to make this second book. Um, and um, it took us a while because then the world collapsed and communication got uh, tangled. And so finally, like Andrea responded uh, our call and we started working together. It turns out, we actually live like a few blocks from each other. So in those come on moments when we were not seeing almost anybody but our parents, Andrea would come to the studio uh, and we would just do like a really long studio visit and then end up with dinner and wine and dessert uh, for about a year, I think it was. Uh, of conversations before we had any materiality, any words or any pictures for the next book. But thank God, uh, El Spac was super generous and super patient with us. And eventually we managed to give birth to unfolding that then Kelsey was so brilliantly at translating. It's strange because we're here to present one book, but it's very hard to talk about the collaboration the three of us had without talking yeah. about the other book that somehow mixed in between. Yeah. Because I do feel that unfolding for me as a writer was like the next step after the visible unseen, yeah. <laughs> which is weird because then in English they come all backwards. Um, no, but it's, sorry. Yeah. It's super interesting because for me, it's it also crossed several bodies of work, like our period mm. together. So in the visible unseen, the, the book cover is actually a picture that I made in 2013 during my grad school. And at that point I was making constructions in the studio with glass and some other kinds of objects that would um, flip light in interesting ways. So I was working in a very dark room and making these pictures, kind of thinking the way Andrea was thinking about light, but instead of putting it in words, I was uh, working with photography. And then by the time we met, 10 years later, almost, yeah. I was doing parallax, which is a series of work that, where I would put up like glass objects on top of a photographic paper in the dark room mm -hmm. and then make multiple exposures. So that the idea of light crossing through uh, several layers of objects and then being come experimented with in the dark room with the chemistry. Like at that point when we met, uh, that's the work, the body of work that I was making. Uh, and I, there's a part in the book where she talks about there's two walls, one is black and white and one is color because I was starting a new body of work. So for me, everything's kind of mixed in like temporalities that are very strange. <laughs> it's true. Making a book takes so many years and making yeah. a book that has several lives also yeah. takes several years. Yeah. Because if we go backwards a bit, um, so I like that the cover is something you did in your MFA because I started this book somehow at the end of my MFA. Yeah. And it was during my MFA where I met Kelsey. Uh, we became friends in Iowa. And she translated me a bit there. <laughs> and we had translation class together. But how, how did you come to translate this book first, Kelsey? Yes. Um, this, is, this is fun because it, it's true that this book is um, the product of a lot of relationships. So it's nice to get to, to highlight those. Um, and yeah, thanks again uh, 
to, to Spencer um, for hosting us. Um, I, so Andrea and I, as she mentioned, uh, overlapped in graduate school in Iowa City where I was studying poetry and then literary translation. And um, we had worked together. Our friendship was pretty literary from the beginning, I think. I had worked on some of, translating some of her poems into English. And I remember um, some long sessions sitting in one of the coffee shops in Iowa City, um, just sort of like talking through possibilities for, for how to put the poems into English. Um, and I, I think that's always been kind of a, yeah, like a, a generative and fruitful place for us to, to think about um, the challenges of translating uh, a work from one language into another. So um, I worked on the first essay, the, the glass essay from The Visible Unseen, actually before, again, the timelines are funny, but before the book was published uh, fully in Spanish. Uh, so the, the publication of that first essay is in a slightly earlier form than it is now in the in the book. It was published in, in Tupelo Quarterly. Um, and I had kind of a similar reaction to you, Fabiola. I just, I just loved this work from the beginning. There was something very special about it. Um, it's my first uh, nonfiction translation, but uh, I felt like many things that I love came together in it for me because it's very... Um, the sentences are just wonderful to work with. They're they're very poetic. There's a lot of sound work. Um, it's a it's a very hybrid book as well, which uh, Andrea can tell you more perhaps about the the forms that the essays take. But um, but I'm interested in that kind of hybrid work that exists between in, in between spaces too. Um, so yeah, it was just a very a very creative uh, a thing to get to do and 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 very collaborative for us from the start. Um, Andrea uh, was always on hand to send me um, YouTube videos and links to websites to help me understand the the more scientific um, the, the deeply scientific aspects of this book, uh, you know, that aren't within my realm of of study. Um, and Fabiola, I'm thinking as well of the the section in unfolding um, where where Andrea is describing in in pretty great detail. Thank you. <laughs> there it is. I don't think we've shown it yet. Maybe we did. Um, beautiful, beautiful book that I'm very happy to to get to work on as well. There's a section though uh, where Andrea is describing your your process and um, and I, I had to do a lot of research and a lot of talking with Andrea to understand um, how to how to put that into into words to create the right kind of picture in the, in the English reader's mind to to see the process because it's such a, a, a process driven kind of work it seems like to me. Um, so there was just to, to to finish answering the question there was quite a bit of time in between the, the three essays in the visible unseen for me. Um, and uh, and yeah, we're very very happy that that Restless Books um, was excited to to work with us on it, um, and I'm very glad it's something that can be can be shared. Thanks, girls. And yes, you bring something to the table that is very important to me as a writer <laughs> that I can share with you, and that I. I shared very deeply with Fabiola, which is our obsession with the process of mm. art and how art gets made, how our minds work. And I think I never was as aware of my own process as yeah. when I had to explain it to Fabiola. I had to explain to Fabiola how I had made The Visible Unseen, mm. how I wrote, what happened in my hair when I was writing in a way I also had to explain to you those things uh, when you were translating. Mm -hmm. You would, the, the very nice thing about our process in translation is that once you show me a draft, usually I think it's what the second to last draft, um, and it's all highlighted. I there are some places where I have to tell you like this is the image in my head, right? Like mm -hmm. this is what I was thinking. This right. is why I what I imagine. These are the kinds of decisions I took to create this. Why don't you try to make the same decisions and see what comes out in English, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, that idea of this year, these are the decisions I'm taking while doing my art. Um, it's something Fabiola and I did too, right? She would tell me how she did photography. And I would try to imagine 
writing as a photographer or writing mm. um, as we were showing this is the other book um, folding uh, which is a very beautiful strange book <laughs> and it's also in English because Kelsey translated it but when we were writing it in Spanish a lot of it was also me trying to explain things to Fabiola and Fabiola showing me and explaining photography and one of the things about the process coming back to the visible and seen was uh, it was a book that is very research heavy. Once I selected the objects, I I had to each essay, it's three essays and an introduction, and each essay took a long, more or less like two, two and a half months to write. And the first month or more I took to read, and I would read about the object, I would read the science of it. I will try to find interesting facts that I love about the different things that I was making. And but I also would read lyrical essays looking for a form that spoke to me. And I, I pay homage to some of the forms. I try to make them my own and to learn from them in the book. And I also experimented a lot with how I I was, I, I said in another conversation we had how my biggest problem when I started writing a lyrical essay was how could I how could I tell when something was finished when a fragment was done and that was very hard for me um but I think so I would like to know I think I would like to know first Kelsey what one of like what kind of challenges you found in the visible and seen um by translating it and how maybe how over we over how did you overcame them yeah, that's a great question. Um, definitely, this involved a lot of research for me too. And we've talked about how um, that's that was one of the skills that was needed for, for translating this particular book. Not necessarily that I also, I don't also need to be an expert in chemistry um, or in the topics that you that you describe, but but what I did need was to to do a lot of reading and to um, do a lot of mining of language that I found uh, online or you know in the articles that you sent um, to to make sure that I was choosing because there is an aspect of, of this book um, in particular that is that there's an accuracy to it um, and I know that that's you know that's kind of a subject that you take in this book is how precise can science be how how precise can words be can language be um, but, uh, but definitely for me, it required more research perhaps than, than any of the poetry books I've ever translated where I'm relying on a different kind of um, method of translating where it's more about my, uh, my poetic ear perhaps, um, or a kind of like um, method of composition that, is, that, that feels different to me. Um, I think another challenge was, you know, working with, with prose is, is newer for me. Um, and we developed together some good strategies, I think, of, of conveying the way that your prose works in Spanish. Um, sometimes in the English, we uh, I ended up using more M dashes, punctuation that doesn't really exist in the Spanish text or, or you know, isn't used in Spanish in the same way, um, as a way of kind of trying to link some of the to link the the more complex concepts um, that that are are carried out in these essays, um, we, there's a lot of funny stories that, that we could tell you about uh, about you know me trying to get my head around how some of these things work. I think a great example for me is um, thinking about trying to think about mirrors and how a mirror actually works. Um, that's one that Andrea and I always mention that it, it, they just seem to get stranger the more that you read about mirrors. It like, doesn't become um, necessarily easier to, to understand because they're so mysterious. But, um, but yeah, it was a, such, a, such a delightful uh, challenge to, to work on this book. I don't know if you have other challenges, Andrea, that you had in mind. Uh, no, I, I, well, I always, I always think about uh, the parts that I thought would be hard in English. Like there uh -huh. are some parts where I I speak about English and the relationship between English and Spanish or about English being the language of science. 
And sometimes I play in Spanish with those ideas. And I think I always okay. thought those places could be hard to get into in back into English where you don't have the ability of having two languages, right? Like you can, you only get one. <laughs> right. Like the section where you're talking about all the different words for glass that yeah. you have access to in Spanish, whereas in English, everything is a glass. A glass. Yes, exactly. And I was thinking while I listened to you um, about this thing that I found that I was obsessed with, the precision of language and how I had to deal with language not being precise at all. And also not only deal with it, but fall in love with the, mm -hmm. that idea. Um, Ambiguity. And, and somehow in that precision, in all there in the, that imprecision of language, um, I found that I'm very intrigued by all the moments of in-betweenness, which is something I think it would be nice for the three of us to talk, even if we move uh, away from the book, I think it's more interesting um, because there are so many things in the collaborations we've made that are about that, about in-betweenness, the idea of translation between two languages, the idea of photography as a medium that is between science and art and technique, the idea of um, this book that tries to move around uh, science and art, or even this, this other book that is the the trying to to find a way to mix images and art and writing into one piece and it's not a book and it's not a piece of art it's something in between so I'm, I'm very fascinated by all the places where you cannot quick like really pinpoint what the thing is and so I wanted to know a little bit about your thoughts about how this idea of all the places that are in between that are also in between the collaboration we've made um, what are you thinking about um, about those things now that we have the books and now that we, we don't know what we're going to do next, probably something, but we don't know what. So I don't know, Fabiola, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I get to go first. <laughs> go. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, it's, it's been wonderful really to to meet you both and to be able to work through so many projects. And I feel like the best thing that happened to me out of the making of the of both books was building a relationship with Andrea. Not that I don't want a relationship with Kelsey, but she lives really far from me. <laughs> and we already Andrea, decided I'm I'm visiting next year. Yeah, you should come. Uh, but yeah, like the the idea of Andrea coming to the studio and having a friend during the pandemic to actually go through the mess of my brain during production. And also just in between bodies of work, in between time, in between como exhibitions and book releases and, you know, like como a, really being como a companion of, of, of work and also of life in general was como a really beautiful thing where like things really collapsed into different places. Um, and then like with the work that we did, uh, especially like through through the book unfolding, these, these lines in between come on, what is process in photography and what is process in literature and how did our careers come, come to be to bring us together at the same, like at that point uh, to be able to make the book. But yeah, like everything seems como very messy in my head. And then at the end I see these books and I go like, oh, it's an object. <laughs> like it's all contained in one situation, you know, like but in the middle of making all of those things, like the lines got really blurred. And I kind of like that. And I like, especially like the questions that Andrea asks through her practice uh, and in the books, like there's several questions that I keep reminding myself when I'm in the studio that, that I, and there's things from the book that I keep pulling um, for new bodies of work. Uh, so yeah, everything seems come on, very mixed. I don't know if that means in between. What are, <laughs> what are some of the questions you said that you still? Well, there's, uh, there's one that I really, like 
I guess, well, it's a quote, it's not a question right now, but um, it's in the visible unseen, uh, she quotes, the art and science of asking questions is the source of all knowledge. And also the ways in which the, the one of the paragraphs that she read earlier uh, where we become glass being burned, you know, like the changing of the state of mind to be able to become the object, mm -hmm. right? Like, like that shift in consciousness to understand an object through being it instead of just looking at its contours and trying to understand its dimensions like the way she works through those things makes me think about the ways in which I think about photography and, and in which I push the boundaries of what photography could possibly do or be, you know? So those are the ones I think I keep in my head, but there's a ton. <laughs> there's like a whole notebook of, of appointments with Andrea. <laughs> it's so great. Yeah, so much other material around around oh, yeah. these books and around the work as well. Um, just to, to finish answering yeah. Andrea, I think um, I, I mentioned it before, but the, but the hybridity of this text is an in, a place that's in between that um, is really meaningful to me. And I, I talk about this example a lot, but um, there are many places in here where I felt that I had to be kind of um, equally innovative in the translation um, uh, in the second writing of this text. So one example is in the first um, the first essay that we were reading from before, and Andrea is talking about um, the aftermath of the 2017 Puebla earthquake, which uh, which you know hit when she was in in Mexico City um, and created incredible devastation. And and the section is about the things that break in that moment or break down. Um, and Andrea really encouraged me to think about uh, which words or phrases go with the word break in English. Not necessarily that, that you're literally translating the things that break in the Spanish text, but um, so for example, I pulled in the idea of, of breaking a habit, breaking habits that wasn't literally in the Spanish text. So there's lots of, lots of moments like that where I feel like the text um, you know, it is sort of like amorphous or multi multi-dimensional uh, in its hybridity. Um, so that's one thing I thought of. And I, uh, I know we're getting close to Q and A. Should we read? Should we read another section, or or I have one question I can. I think ask you. you can say your question. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I am reading this book that uh, my friend Julie Lund gave me. And it's called Ninety Nine Variations on a Proof. Andrea, you're going to love it. Um, maybe you know it too, Fabiola, but uh, there's a quote in here that I'm going to put in the chat because it's a little bit complex, but I immediately thought of this book and I wanted to talk, I wanted to ask both of you what you think of this. Um, so um, here's the quote. It's from Raymond Quinault, who helped start the Ulipo Experimental Writing Group. He was also, you know, kind of like an amateur mathematician. Uh, and he said, we might say giving art its ambiguous sense that science oscillates from art to game and art from game to science. Uh, and I thought that might be an interesting one, interesting quote just to put before both of you and see what you think. Andrea, I was specifically thinking of the mirror section where you talk about mirrors being kind of a, I think you say a game of light and angles. What do you what do you think about art? I'm bringing in even another element, not just art and science, but art and science and game. I like the idea of game, and I'm sure Fabiola likes it too, because if there is something I learned throughout all of these collaborations is, and even even when I started the first when I started writing with science language, uh, when I started writing my thesis. It was my first semester in Iowa. I had to write poetry. I had never written poetry and I was struggling a lot. And, and then I wrote this weird quirky poem that followed a recipe I had made in chemistry. I had, I had synthesized aspirin in chemistry. And so the poem is something like, um, 
if love was like synthesizing aspirin. So I would go through the recipe and say all the ways in which love would be so much easier if it was as easy as synthesizing uh, medicine. And I pulled it in front of my professor, Luis Muñoz, who also was my thesis um, instructor who helped me make the book. And, and he said, this is wonderful. You should keep doing this. And I remember very clearly saying to him, is this poetry? It's too much fun to do this <laughs> poetry. I'm having too much fun playing with language, right? Because poetry is that it's, it's many things, but in one of its iterations, it's playing with language, making language a game and making language playful and fun and just twisting it so it has to do other things, right? Or like breaking it in the same way if I want to go into a metaphor that can help Fabiola is somehow poetry is like this um, crystal, like this prism. And if you put words into it, they just fragment into rainbows, mm -hmm. right? They just become very colorful and do things that were there all along, but we couldn't see them. Um, and I like that idea of a game because I also like when art stops being serious or like stops feeling like a pressure over me. And it's just to people who are trying, yes, to not even to solve questions, but just to pinpoint what the questions are yeah. and then just <laughs> throw answers at the wall and see which one sticks. I don't know, I like the idea. And I, I find the quote, I, I want to think about it more because it's weird and it's nice in so many ways. Um, because I do think that science has that element. I always think science and art meet in the sense that they are both birthed out of the curiosity of the human mind, yeah. that they are very human pursuits. And there are two ways of trying, two ways that are very like similar, like two faces of a coin that are trying to look at the world and understand it. And so I like that there is a little element of fun and of fascination in the middle of all of this. And it's just not just not just dry, but also like we like the fun of learning and knowing. I don't know. What do you think, Fa? Mm. Um I love it. I've always I always thought of the way I make I come to the ideas or the pictures through experiments, so through mm. playing, right? Like, and the, in the last three years, it has been playing in the dark room, which is, I don't know if you've ever been in a dark room, but it's so much fun. Um, and it's really intense at the same time. Uh, but there is something beautiful about this quote where, yeah, like it, it, like the idea that it oscillates, like that it's not stable, right? Like that the things are not, just said not be, because it's scientific doesn't actually make it like written in rock no uh, science as Andrea explained to me like these few years like changes all the time like it's constantly evolving and yeah. the reputation that it has of being like total truth while it's come on yeah certainly there's like an aspect of that but then there's like millions of theories that have been disproven throughout the years, right? Like, so it's it's ever, it's ever evolving like knowledge and, and so it's hard. Uh, and then there's this one other quote from Andrea's book that I think come on, wraps up also the way she oscillates between mm -hmm. writing and, and the scientific mind and chemistry and the creative practice. Um, it's in page 124, uh, it's also a quote that says, science is ultimately a matter of feeling or rather of desire, the desire to know or the desire to realize, right? And so is games, so sea, the play is also about desire and so is yeah. art. So I thought that like just to leave you guys with something <laughs> uh, from the book again. I think we can go into the questions. There are a few. And, yeah, of course. And, um, hello, and everyone. Then, I'm back to uh, speak on behalf of the audience. Um, if you have questions uh, for our authors this evening, again, uh, please do submit those 
Uh, I will be reading off a few uh, as we have time tonight. Um, before we go to audience Q&A though, uh, I did wanna add one more, I think great quote from the book that is on this topic exactly, which is like, you know, science is like Fabio was saying, you know, the scientific theories are not written in stone. Like science is changing. Um, and there's this uh, quote from actually like the, the first page of the book that I continue to think about. Um, uh, Andrea is describing a, a dinner party she's having with friends. Um, they're, they're just making discussion. And she says, someone, uh, someone else, one of the artists at the, at the party decides to play devil's advocate, um, wondering how science can be perceived as reliable, that is, quote unquote, true, if theories change over time and often contradict one another. Uh, a and I try to explain why precisely that is the marvel of science and what separates it from dogma. And I love that quote. I wrote it down. I have it on a little index card next to my desk. Um, I mean, it's perfect. I think it's a perfect encapsula encapsulation of what, you know, what, what science is, why science can change and why, um, you know, especially lately when people, you know, put uh, science or try and um, make scientific fact or theory less credible than it really is, uh, why that's important to keep in mind. So there's a whole history of it anyways, but I just wanted to throw that out there as well. Um, we have, so our first question is from Dan. Uh, actually, I think it's directed at Fabiola. Um, let's see, and Dan, you can correct me in the chat if, if I'm um, misinterpreting this, but uh, Dan says, light is central in this book and Fabiola described working with light in the dark room, uh, apparently using film technology. And his question is, I'm curious whether you also use digital photography, uh, photography for light studies or if you find unique results with film that digital cannot match? Um, I also oscillate between digital <laughs> and analog and because it's like 2022 and, you know, like I love technology, like it allows us to do unimaginable things. So it depends on the body of work. Um, if you look at the light studies that I have on the website or on Instagram, they're uh, a part of them are done with a four by five film uh, uh, slide uh, negative camera. And then another half of them are made with a digital camera that could make multiple exposures. So yeah. uh, it depended on the access that I have at, at the moment. Uh, it turns out in developing four by five in Mexico is virtually impossible. So, and then years later, I built my own darkroom and I started working directly on the photographic paper. So all of the um, pictures from unfolding, oh, sorry, like I wanted to show you also thinking about play, we thought about making a book that the, the spectator could fold yeah. the same way I fold the paper in the darkroom, right? So the, the, the photograms are made directly by folding the photographic paper and exposing it to different colors of light. Um, so there's no digital, like everything's made in complete yeah. darkness and it's all about touch. Uh, and it turned out to be a lot about como the body and the way we como orient ourselves when we cancel the sight. Hi, <laughs> the cat, sorry. Uh, so it depends, like the, the cover of the book for the visual on scene was made with a large format digital camera. And inside the pictures are, are like silver gelatin prints, photograms. Uh, and then the other one is C print photograph, folded photograph. So it like us, yeah, every project I change kind of the way I investigate into photography. Wow. I hope that answers. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for also the more demonstration of uh, the unfolding. I think that's, I mean, it's one of those things you you have to see that live. Yeah. You have to like hold it in your hands or have someone yeah. show it to you on camera. That is beautiful. Wow. Thanks. Yeah. So like, if you do get the unfolding book, please fold it. Yeah. <laughs> we spend a lot of time thinking about that. <laughs> Fabiola is the only one that folds it because Nobody I'm wants horrible to. at it. I love it, but I'm horrible at it. And everyone <laughs> else book. thinks... The book is too precious to fold when it's made to be fold. <laughs> I think it should be folded. Yes, it should. Uh, it was also a it was a great yeah. surprise um, 
yeah. when I finally understood that the pages were to be folded when I was translating it because Andrea sent a text, of course, that's just, you know, yeah, in, like in text format on a page. And so finally, when I understood which sections would be kind of, you know, hidden behind a fold or um, actually folded onto the next page, that was very lovely and surprising. Yeah. <laughs> Did that change the way you translated anything? Imagine, I guess. Um, it did. There, there were some sections where, where we, Andrea was uh, helped me with this, but we had to think about which section, which few words should go together. Yeah. Um, okay. And because of the Spanish syntax, yeah, there she has it there. So yeah. sometimes because of the Spanish syntax versus the English syntax, we changed which few words go together and yeah. appear together on pages. That's yeah. so cool. Wow. It was yeah. really fun. It's like translating in like four dimensions or something. Um, yeah, that's yeah. really good. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And then and then Fabiola was in charge of like the placement of the words in Spanish and English is different too. Yeah. Because Fabiola placed them in a way mm -hmm. because the words in English are smaller and the words in Spanish are yeah. bigger. And so where they are like the books are a little bit different um, in Spanish and English. She they because they are placed differently depending on the language. Too. Yeah. That's interesting, like the visual aspect of English being como so short, so punctual uh, at the yeah. same time, but in Spanish you take a long time to say something. <laughs> yeah. All right. uh, Sherry has a question um, about uh, Spanish words for glass. Uh, Sherry says, you said there were many words for glass in Spanish uh, and few in English. Uh, how did you uh, handle the translation of those words and did those words launch discussions about what glass is and what it means to people i think well that's a good answer although i think the the, the part we were talking about um mm -hmm. it's not that spanish has that many words for glass but it's more than there is this part uh where i talk about how english everything is glass in english right. um uh-huh and oh, in Spanish, yeah. I get a lot of na different names, but not, not in the sense that I don't say vidrio, but in the sense that they have like an, a last name, right? I think yeah. it is. It's, um, um, it's section 21 on page yeah. 21. So do you um, want to read it in English? My yeah, I can, I can read some of that and I can tell you sort of what we, what we did in the translation. So it says, the language of science today is English, but writing in Spanish makes things simpler for me given this particular subject. In English, glass is a broad category in which everything made of this material is a glass. Maybe this expresses its deep instability more accurately than Spanish's many words. Not only is the threat of breaking glass ever present, but a glass can be the thing for holding water or wine. Then there are eyeglasses for seeing, hourglasses for measuring time, sunglasses, magnifying glasses to enlarge small things, and spy glasses to observe the far away, storm glasses for measuring the weather, and even the glass formed by lightning at the beach. Glass is one thing, glass is all of them. So that was where we, I think we inserted a couple of times um, writing in Spanish to remind the English reader that this yeah. was a, that this is a translation, and that um, and that was kind of the way of conveying like you know, we had to we were working with many many names for glass in the Spanish. Yeah, and I think what we meant is so in the Spanish it says un glass puede ser el vidrio para el agua o para el vino. So vidrio para el agua makes no sense in Spanish. A glass for water, right? We call it un vaso. Right, different <laughs> right. names. So, so each each different glass in Spanish, like the word glass, it's always repeating in English. And I repeat the word vidrio to show that. Uh, but in Spanish, you really have a name for each of those things, right? Like these are in glasses. Estos son anteojos. And so uh -huh. each, each different thing, object has its name in a way where English has this echo. But I like how the translation, like I think somehow it works very well in both. Mm -hmm. it, it is stranger in Spanish. Like yeah. it, it sounds more natural in, in English, <laughs> but in Spanish it, it, it has like this strange effect of not naming the things, like describing the things instead of naming them, which is, I guess, weird. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I love this paragraph too. I mean, the just like breaking down the fact that, you know, it's like, I think a lot of native English speakers like don't, uh, there's like no disambiguation um, to some of the words we use. And then we don't, only when it's pointed out to us, we realize like, oh my God, like the word glass means 15 different things, but we use the same word for it, but mm -hmm. on context so easily, yeah. Um, and we have time for just one more. We have a great, another great question from Dan who asks, uh, well, Andrea's and Fabiola's cats have now made on-screen appearances and Kelsey has a cat. Can we expect another collaboration this time on feline <laughs> instead of glass and light? We should ask ourselves that. <laughs> how, <laughs> how we make a book between languages in between mediums and about <laughs> cats. <laughs> There's a market. For it. I I know there is. I guarantee it. It's a yeah. shared love. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you to the three of you. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Fabiola. This has been a really exactly the conversation I wanted to hear tonight. So I would I'm really happy about this. Um, thank you to everyone who came out and listened, uh, or if you're watching from the future on YouTube. Uh, hello. Um, we're. We're so excited to support literature and translation, uh, especially with our virtual event series. Um, and uh, do in, any of you have any last uh, comments before we close out tonight? Yes, I want to say this is a very special night. I It's the only time I get to talk to both Kelsey and Fabiola. And I just wanted to thank them for all they've made, done, for the trust they have in the books and in my in the book and in my words. Um, having been selected by Fabiola because of this book to make another one was very special to me. Uh, made me realize that my the way I see the world had many avenues that it could exist in. And sharing the experience with Kelsey is always a pleasure. And she also, both of them, has shown me new ways of seeing my own writing. Uh, so I just wanted to say that that they they have shown me things I didn't know about how I write, and both of them. With, with these collaborations, I learned, I for the longest time, I thought writing and writing books was a monologue that I had with myself and something that stayed in me. And through this all, I learned that art is a conversation and that it's, that is the, the art word making is the art that has, makes you converse with others and hope that someone else wants to talk to you about it. So thank you both for being here and thank you both for making two books with me. It feels very special. Thank you, Dean. Same. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And thank you to Restless Books for making this beautiful edition. Uh, I was so impressed when I received it. Thank you, Alison. And thank you, Spencer, for hosting tonight. It's been yeah. beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And so, like Fabio said, thank you so much to Restless Books, who is a you know champion yeah. of international literature. Um, there are very few <laughs> publishers doing the kind of work that they do, and it is wonderful yeah. to work with them. So. Thank you all and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thanks again. Bye.